Um, so yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks for still showing up at uh, this time of the day. And especially thanks for showing up to a talk uh, where the title wasn't exactly clear, so we had a little mishap. So actually the title of the talk was why you're reading just two new Docker platforms as a service, and then another sentence came and things got nasty. Um, the, the, sorry? Yeah. My fault, sorry. No, no worries no. there. It actually it played into our cards because um, the Docker landscape is, is quite confusing and quite fast paced. And we, it, couldn't, it, could, it couldn't be a better fit um, that just like two days ago, Docker announced another uh, paradigm called containers as a service, just like two or three days ago. So our talk title was reworked yesterday, and now Docker will show us what this is actually about. Yeah. Um, OK, so we decided we go with this title. Uh, and yeah, to show you how to build your own cloud, uh, your own platform as a service, maybe, uh, while staying in business. Um, first of all, Welcome uh, again to MicroExchange, and uh, yeah, it's it's late already, and we won't keep you uh, from Guinness or from the panel or from finger food or whatever else <laughs> is uh, is uh, waiting for you. Um, so first of all, we want to uh, tell you about why we are going to uh, give this talk and what's all about. Um, uh, the, the plan is to not make you feel bad that you're not using the latest stuff or that you're uh, doing something wrong, but give you a good feeling uh, about stuff that, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, as Bash already said, it's a complicated topic, and as we heard before, it's, there's a lot of stuff moving, and you need uh, hardcore IT uh, for, for it, and um, uh, yeah, so it's easy to, to miss stuff. Um, um, but uh, yeah, we think in the end there are, there are a lot of tools out there that can make your life better. Um, and it's, it's about a personal journey for us, so it's a lot of personal views. Uh, if it's not applying for you, no problem, don't feel bad about that, it's yeah, our own personal taste. So uh, this uh, talk is about infrastructure, as noted on the, on the card, this little I is uh, for infrastructure apparently. Um, or maybe infotainment. Uh, <laughs> As you thought. Um, um, so, uh, yeah, as, uh, as already said, um, building infrastructure is hard, and yeah, nowadays, maybe even harder than 10 years before. Uh, so many choices to choose from, uh, so many different directions you can, you can go. You have microservices, you can still build monoliths. Uh, Rails, for example, is still uh, propagating this paradigm. Uh, you have uh, a bunch of uh, cloud providers, you have infrastructure providers, you have higher level platform as a service providers, you even have now container as a service uh, providers. And all the stuff, uh, still there's bare metal out there. It's not easy, the tools are yeah, uh, unnumbered. Uh, some of them are production ready, some are not. Some are look promising, they're gone the next day. So it's not, not, uh, not very easy, but still a lot of fun. Um, yeah, because of, of Docker, Docker is, uh, did, did a huge thing for, for the whole infrastructure topic, and yeah, we heard before, uh, um, yeah, very excessive in, in, in introduction to Docker and what it's all capable of. So we don't going into Docker in this talk again, um, uh, but we will show you some different approaches uh, how to tackle infrastructure problems. Um, and as James Lewis al already said in this morning, um, we have to get things done, right? So it's not all about fun. We have to uh, get our business running. We have to find pragmatic solutions for problems. It's not always about finding the perfect solution. Also, this is a very interesting quest, but uh, sometimes it's, uh, it should be just an intellectual quest. And um, uh, the pragmatic solutions are perfectly fine, too. And uh, the last thing is we are loving it. So we are... Uh, um, uh, both passionate about uh, building software and, and doing infrastructure. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's basically it's why we are giving this talk. Um, and uh, to, to give you a, a roadmap, what's, what's coming uh, and, and topics. So we are, we are facing some challenges, opportunities in our field of work. And first to the challenges. Uh, as you might uh, notice, everything is getting more complex. Uh, it's not only the infrastructure, software tech, uh, stacks are getting more complex. We're building abstraction layer on an abstraction layer. If you attended the talk about the unique kernels uh, from Florian before, uh, he mentioned, yeah, maybe we, we sometimes uh, uh, remove some of those abstraction layers. Um, 
but generally we are just putting on another one. Um, uh, the uh, multiple environments, not only we have, have our dev environment, we have a stage, we have uh, a production environment, <clears throat> so we have something to, to load test uh, maybe. So this is all getting bigger and bigger, where we have to run stuff, where we have to uh, try out our software. Um, of course, the cloud is everywhere, but still, as I said, there's bare metal, we have uh, a mix of clouds, some some of uh, our stuff maybe run on AWS. We still have some compute engine. I heard before a lot of people are using compute engine because of the billing method to uh, to test out new new things. But in the end, deploy to AWS. You have um, private uh, uh, hosted systems somewhere else for for critical infrastructure. Maybe you got a DNS provider somewhere entirely different. All this have to be connected somehow. You have to to manage every everything. Uh, new technologies are coming around uh, yeah, almost every day, or even twice a day. Uh, and of course, everything has to be communicated within your team, within your company, between companies, between customers, contractors. You have to uh, document it for new hires, for, yeah, for heri your heritage or your legacy to, to be maintainable. Uh, and this that didn't get any easier with, with all this more complex stuff and different clouds everywhere. So this is the challenges we face today. But there are also a lot of opportunities. First of all, infrastructure, uh, we, we got it on demand, right? So with all this cloud stuff, infrastructure, and not only service, the entire infrastructure, even networks, storage, database, everything is on demand nowadays. Um, with this comes, the infrastructure is available uh, through APIs. You don't have to, to click yourself around. Uh, you can still do this, of course but um, infrastructure is available through APIs. Um, and this is, uh, yeah, this is brought to you by powerful machines that are very cheap um, in, in contrast to, to what they uh, are capable of. And that, that brought us to virtualization and containerization in the end. Right? You, you, have a, you have machines that are way more powerful than you would need for your average application. It's, it's hard to, to get uh, a modern server or even a modern laptop uh, to its capacity with, yeah, with a simple, with, with an everyday app. So um, virtualization and containerization plays into this to get the most value out of your, out of your hardware. Yeah, that's why we're doing this talk. Um, but as you have uh, noticed, we didn't introduce ourselves yet. <laughs> so who we are, why, why it's a good fit uh, to talk about this uh, by us. Um, so, I'm a, I'm a freelancer, and Sebastian is a freelancer as well. Uh, I have a developer background. I'm still doing some infrastructure tasks or operation stuff, but I'm mainly a developer. Um, and Sebastian is mainly operations. He's still doing some development, but <coughs> so he's an operations part of both of us. So and if, um, if you never have heard of us uh, before, but I, I guess you have, uh, because it's uh, DevOps. <laughs> Might have heard of us. Yeah. So, uh, and Sebastian will now tell you a little, little more about Dev, DevOps. Yeah. So, um, just a little story on that um, buzzy buzzy word. So, in case of any, in case anyone isn't sure yet, so um, I got myself uh, certified as a DevOps like two years ago at this exact vicinity. So, just to be sure, uh, we know what we are talking about. Um, it's not to poke. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's, it's not only to poke, um, yeah, it's, it's real, it's, it's Comic Sans, you can tell it's real. Um, it's, it's not to poke fun on the whole DevOps uh, mythology, but it's just like in kind of the same way, like we ruined Scrum, it took us just a few years to ruin the, the actual word DevOps, so um, commonly we refer to the thing we actually do as some kind of engineering, at least we think it's engineering. So um, it's a bit of a mockery, but it's also like there are also true parts on it. So like we said, Dirk is doing like the software part. I do the software part, Dirk is doing the infrastructure part. I'm also involved in infrastructure. So it's not so much about the, the thing that's, that precedes the engineering, but more about what we're doing. So it might be software engineering, but it also gets more and more into uh, infrastructure engineering. Uh, we have to do with a lot of different tools. Uh, take a lot of metrics, uh, react to events, and also uh, document stuff. So this is the, the actual engineering bit in there. But as you have, might have noticed, I um, talk a lot, lot about tools. So let's see what's in our tool shed. Um, just as a 
kind of a disclaimer. Uh, this talk might contain some HashiCorp tools. What is going on over here? Wait a second. That's not supposed to happen. Let's go. Everything's fine. Yeah. It's fine? It's fine. Okay, it's fine, I guess. Um, there are a lot of different tools. Um, there, this talk might contain a lot of HashiCorp tools, but uh, that wasn't like, to be, like meant to be a sales pitch. Um, all the existing tools have their, their scope, have their own goals, and they all have a, a proper right to exist. So this is not about bashing onto our, on other tools. This is short, just like telling a story what works for us. Um, as you can tell from the, um, from the slide you I already spoiled, the, the tool set isn't getting smaller or, or simpler. It's getting complex with every iteration, more complex uh, with every iteration. And all of the tools you see uh, move closer to the, the, to the developer. So as Peter said, it's, it's no longer just like clicking stuff. It's, you have to have like a basic knowledge of what's going on. And those tools who, uh, like 10 years ago, were only used by the, the ops people um, are now really, really close to the actual developer side. And at the same time, the, the concepts and paradigms developers had also influence uh, infrastructure tools. So um, like a 2015 data center is way more automated and documented than it, it was like 10 or 15 years ago. So it's not like it's been bad all the time. Um, yeah, so let's have a look at tools. So it would be really, really cool if there was the one tool. So, um, I mean, the longer you've been in like our business, the more tools and paradigms you saw come and go. So uh, at our age, probably I wrote my uh, diploma thesis, I guess Doug as well, about software-oriented architecture. Yeah. Um, we, we saw a lot of um, Java-related, um, yeah, not, not, not exactly hypes, but you, you've seen some things come and go. So you already know, OK, I have to uh, evaluate stuff. And to like, brighten up the room a bit, you look quite amazed. Let's do a little quiz. Um, have a go. I'm going to read the sentence. Something, something is designed to handle many of the mundane tasks of developers and allow them to get the important, unique part of the application. They host the developer's application, back it up, monitor it, scale it, so the developer has to, doesn't have to. They handle logging, groups, users, and session management. So just as a quick game, shout out if you know what tool or software we're talking about. All of them. Which one? All of, All of the software. You're getting close. <laughs> <laughs> Any other ideas? He's onto something. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we, we won't spoil the fun for now. So uh, we're going to keep the tension a bit more. But um, yeah, let's see where this is going. So as, you, as I said, you saw some tools come and go. And no matter which community you come from, they all look like they could be the one tool for you. So if you're into, uh, into Python, then Mercuri Mercurial looks like a good thing to have. So if you're into the uh, Chef, uh, into the Ruby community, and deploy a Rails app, then Chef might be your one tool. And it actually, for your use case, it is the one tool you need. But if you step back a few inches, or yeah, say meters, um, then you come to look like, um, like uh, you're a warrior on a quest for the Holy Grail. You keep like, talking about um, the air, a swallow travels south, but you completely missed the point. So from time to time, it's good to just like step back a few, um, a few meters and see if it's really the one tool for your problem, or is it an adequate tool for your problem. Um, so after we have this out of the way, um, uh, let's take a look at some tools we like to use. So some of them are eventually used by you too. We see how that turns out. Ours not, but maybe we can just exchange a bit uh, and see how this goes. This is the second disclaimer, so watch closely. Um, the following audiences, um, uh, the following slides are approved for our audience, but may contain traces of subjectivity. So this might work for us. This might totally not work for you. Uh, keep that in mind. Um, we are all here to tell a story bound to our customer use cases, our personal use cases, and our general experience in shipping software. But all of our views are subjective, and we have to just, you have to decide uh, what you can take home from this. Um, and like Dirk used to phrase it, objects at conferences appear shinier than they are. So 
Um, let's see. Let's go back. Take a take a week and see what actually works for you. And like in the Cologne Ruby community, we have a good old tradition. So if you want to um, hear stories from the good old Ruby days, we all gather around the fire, um, have Dirk pour whiskey, and um, let's go and let Dirk tell how he worked a few years ago. Yeah, so Ruby development, yeah, when I started it, I started it with, uh, together with Rails. So there was no, not something like Bundler around or something like that. This was uh, really, uh, Mac OS didn't even have a proper package manager. Uh, I think it still doesn't, if I remember correctly. <laughs> um, but you have everything to install by yourself. And uh, I don't know if anyone remembers this site, Hive Logic, from Dan Benjamin, nowadays uh, famous for his podcast. One, one hand, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but this was a, was a site I was regular visiting to, to help setting up uh, the Ruby on Rails uh, stack on, on my machine every time a new OS X release come around you know, with the coworkers uh, staff. Or, uh, at the university, I gave uh, um, workshops and yeah, setting this up. This was a, I put some of this in scripts, but they were really brittle and yeah, not, not so fun to use. And um, yeah, everything changes uh, all the time, but then there was, there was hope at the horizon, and uh, the, the hope arrived in, in the form of Vagrant, and I just could do Vagrant provision, and everything was fine. It was super awesome uh, all of a sudden. So uh, all problems solved for me on the side. Uh, I could just go on, build my stuff in, inside the Vagrant box, uh, and hand over whatever comes out of this, and uh, give it to Bash, and yeah, I think he will show you now how, how he handled my, my uh, artifacts, my compilations, whatever. Yeah. So yeah, no matter in which part of ops or DevOps you work, at some point you get into the like, automation track and you get into the uh, configuration management track. So um, in, in my world, um, the, the thing, I, as I told you, is subjective. In my world, it was uh, Puppet. I used uh, Puppet for everything, so I got into um, even provisioning my whole own laptop with Puppet because I could do it, and it seemed like the appropriate thing to do. Um, <laughs> and I could just like get rid of a lot of um, uh, manual scripting or manual processes and tinkering with services and um, having like snowf no snowflake-like unique machines. Um, and in the same way that Dirk told you, Vagrant changed the game for developers. Um, Chef or Puppet or Ansible or whatnot um, also changed a lot of how we approach operations. So, in that way, we are fine. And thank you. Okay, let's see. Um, let's, get, let's go back to. Yeah, yeah. I, I just I skipped another. This is getting too fast. This macOS. Um, yeah, we got all the new tools. We're using it for mundane, mundane infrastructure tools and for plumbing. And let's have a closer look at what's going on. So, you want to take over? Yeah. So, uh, what? Uh, uh, sorry. Don't let any Linux desktop user near yeah. any of those <laughs> machines. Okay. So uh, in, inside my Vagrant box, it just came up nicely, and I could reproducibly uh, start up, and everything was nice. I would make something like this, right? Uh, CD into my million dollar app, and uh, call rake build, and something was going on. And in the end, I got this uh, Debian package I could hand over to, um, to Sebastian. So uh, what I did was I, I had some code. I compiled it, built it, and I created an artifact. And this artifact I handed over to uh, to operations, basically, to install it on a server that uh, a new version of this uh, app was uh, running, and I could do more millions. And on the server, uh, Bash will show you what happened there. Yeah, as you remember, Puppet. So this is a bit of Puppet syntax. It it looks like Ruby, but it's completely broken. Um, you have the same same things. I have a package name. I have um, some keywords, package and server. And I have those, uh, this little spermy operator to connect those two bits. So what this just says, OK, take this package, install the latest version of it, and notify the service that something has to be restarted or triggered. So everything could be fine with like, those two bits. And um, it seemed like a really, really good idea. So let's see. It's the same thing. We have code, which is the Puppet code. We have some sort of compilation, which is Puppet compiling a catalog and sending it to the agents. Um, and we have an artifact. And it, 
this is something that's just like appeared from talking with each other. Um, it doesn't seem that way, that this is some kind of artifact, because it's just like run top of the apply on some boxes. Um, but if you think of a machine that's like running for the last like two days, um, that has probably installed updates. Meanwhile, installing another package of that version or of another version actually mixes or like um, diffuses the lines between your server and the actual artifact. So um, even if your um, application hasn't like changed uh, totally by gluing it onto the server, the actual server somehow also is something that feels like an artifact. So, yeah. <clears throat> Let's look at all this uh, infrastructure thingy. Um, so even if your application is a monolith, so and we are still talking monolith, so this was a Rails application that deployed, um, the infrastructure also has a lot of building blocks. So at the moment, we're just talking about like these servers, whatever that may be for you. Um, but there are a lot of other blocks also containing like, network, uh, databases, storage, uh, monitoring, logging. And, and all of those bits um, are no longer real hardware, but getting more and more virtualized. Talking servers, talking software networking, talking um, databases as a service, um, also storage as a service. And going for microservice doesn't actually help or resolve anything. You end up with having more artifacts over the place because you tend to change AWS parameters, you um, tend to try something out in the UI, tend to change values there. And by doing this, you iterate over different versions and actually, without even knowing it, creating new kinds of um, artifacts. So this is something uh, I just noticed. And the next slide. Um, a second? Yeah. Um, it turns out that there wasn't only like one application written. Um, even the Rails application is inherently complex. So this is no longer just handling requests. It, has a, it might have services, it might have tasks, it might have um, queues. So it's no longer um, a single, OK, yeah, this is a monolith. This isn't even the application itself might contain services while feeling monolithic. So the average system then might look something like this. And we're not talking about real microservices yet. Um, even a distributed monolith needs to run somewhere. So in the end, you might have everything um, you have for building blocks. So you might have a build process that uh, outputs an artifact. And you might have a puppet configuration management that takes care of installing or restarting or rebooting stuff for you. But it never felt quite right. You know? So to summarize things, I mean, we've come a long way, and some of the problems got solved, but in overall, things are still kind of finicky. Um, so let's, let's just look, uh, have a look at our, at our checklist. Um, we do have an increasing complexity, um, talking microservices, talking services, talking um, complexity hidden inside an app. Um, we still have, um, I mean, if you're in like enterprise environments, um, you have to deal with um, cryptographic uh, problems. You have to um, ship around uh, private keys. You have to exchange credentials somewhere. So running, uh, changing a running system is still hard. And um, in the same way, um, if, you, um, if you ever saw someone bootstrapping a Puppet Master with Puppet in an elegant way, then tell me. Um, but you always end up with something that's still finicky, that's still complicated, and it's automated, but. Um, and uh, if you remember the, the actual architecture diagram, we still haven't covered the actual like databases, networks, uh, firewalls, um, because we still were fixed and um, concentrated on servers. And that's when a new paradigm, like four years ago, started out. Um, which was infrastructure as code, or infrastructure is code, or infrastructure code. Um, we came to realize that more and more infrastructure is acting like software, and we need different approaches. So what we really want is have our infrastructure completely in code, not just some of it, not just some parts and others in other parts. We want to have uh, code describing our infrastructure, and let's see what you have to, to, to do to get there. 
Um, so the basic problem is, with, with all this infrastructure stuff, uh, you don't want to run infrastructure, you want to run a business, right? You want to earn money with, with your business. If your business happens to be running infrastructure, okay, that's a different story, but most of the time, I assume you're not running infrastructure as a business, but some, some other kind of business. Um, at the same time, you need the flexibility to adapt your infrastructure uh, uh, in the best way very fast to changing business needs, right? Uh, and you want to be able to evaluate new technologies in an easy, fast, and safe way, right? So this is, this is some, some tensions between all these points. So in, in the best case, you just ignore the whole infrastructure uh, thing, uh, but then you maybe uh, have problems with the other two points. Um, uh, there, there's the danger of a vendor lock-in here, but it's, it's not, not a bad thing. Vendor lock-in always sounds kind of bad, but it's not a bad thing a as it. So, yeah, you, if you're going all AWS, uh, it's, it's kind of a vendor lock-in, but do you have any alternatives? So just running your own bare metal and pulling this off, um, this shouldn't be something... You should keep in mind that vendor lock-in is something you, you have to evaluate, but uh, it's not something uh, that's bad as it, uh, as it is. Um, and for us, it's, uh, it's always uh, the question, okay, how to find the best mix of all possible solutions. So it's not, uh, maybe not all going onto a platform as a service, not all uh, running on, on root servers uh, under your desk, uh, but something in, in between. Um, so uh, if, if you look at a platform as a service, as a kind of checklist, uh, that we expect from, from a platform. So even if we build it uh, ourself, um, ourselves, we, we still want to check those marks. So first of all, uh, that's uh, already Peter said it before, it's uh, uh, what brought Docker us, it's we have uh, the same environment for devs and production. So dev production parity, uh, that's something we really want. If it's always uh, manageable, always the truth, uh, what, what was promised is another story, but that's something we, we wish for, right? Uh, we want to have repeatable builds, um, so not only for, for our servers, but for, for everything that we build, uh, we, this should be repeatable and produce for the same inputs, the same outputs. That's, yeah, that's the best case. Uh, we want to track our artifacts, so what was built at what point in time, give them version numbers, uh, discover them for, for later use, something like that. Uh, something like that. Um, inter infrastructure should be immutable in, in the best, so uh, from the outside we just trigger actions and this changes the infrastructure, but we cannot change uh, the running infrastructure uh, structure itself by changing it inside the server, something like that. Uh, but we have to create a new artifact and uh, roll it out into the infrastructure and uh, yeah, run through the entire build pipeline to make any changes happen. Uh, yeah, and it should uh, cover the entire stack, not as, as seen before, only uh, the server part, but it should be able to cover uh, networking, storage, logging, monitoring, everything that's, uh, that's somehow uh, into this. So let's start with the repeatable builds. Maybe this is the most easy part. And uh, yeah. Uh, obviously, as I said before, we are talking about, uh, we will present your HashiCorp tools. Uh, and the tool for uh, creating repeatable builds is uh, Pucker. It's a tool that uh, takes a uh, configuration file, in, in this case a JSON file, and pr uh, produce single machine images. So whatever that means at this point in time. This could be AWS, this could be a Vagrant file, it could be a Docker image. So the support is um, very uh, wide. And uh, in code, this looks something like this. Uh, there's, a, there's an array of builders that is um, available. So in this case, we are, we are building a Docker image with, uh, with Pekka. Then we run some provisioners on this image. And in the end, we are pushing it uh, to any Docker registry. Um, yeah, uh, what uh, provisioners can, whatever you want, from inline shell scripts to uh, chef with, with Chef Server, whatever you, uh, whatever you like. Uh, so for me, for example, Ansible works pretty good in this environment because yeah, I'm always starting from, uh, from scratch anyway when uh, building a new machine or uh, updating a package. Uh, this works nicely for me. You yeah, just can play around, and uh, especially if you want to uh, try out Docker, uh, for example, uh, you can just take your existing provisioning um, code and yeah, build with the Docker images with the help of Pucker, for example. And uh, that's a command that's running. At this time, no fancy rainbows or uh, other stuff. <laughs> uh, 
Um, yeah, you, you just run Pucker build, and uh, the result will be whatever you define in your in your configuration. So one, two, n machines will uh, be generated. Uh, after that, we now need the rest of the infrastructure. This Pucker just creates um, uh, servers. This could be database servers, for example, uh, as well. So everything that is somehow deployed on a server uh, is somewhat covered by um, by Pucker. And uh, yeah, but there's more more to this infrastructure. There's uh, networks, there's DNS. Uh, uh, firewalls need to get new holes uh, to talk to each other, and all this other infrastructure plumbing stuff. You know, name anything. So all this should be covered in in code if you want to have uh, real infrastructure as code. And uh, Terraform is a tool uh, that works great for us. Uh, it again has a declarative configuration where you describe your infrastructure and it uh, figures out the, the, the moving parts, how to bring your current infrastructure to a new state. Um, and this could be uh, AWS, this could be uh, Rackspace, uh, this could be even bare metal. Um, so this is, uh, again, really flexible, so you can plug, uh, uh, plug together different providers you, you have. Um, and not only uh, um, have to run it on a, on a single platform. So uh, if you're running AWS and you're familiar with it, CloudFormation is, uh, is a tool like Terraform, but only allows you to uh, work with AWS. Uh, and this looks like this. It's uh, not JSON. It's a HashiCorp configuration language, much nicer than JSON, um, because it allows for comments. And you, you define different resources. Resources can have uh, dependencies. Uh, like this one, uh, it's, it's implicit. So the security group down here is based on this resource security group up there. And Terraform will figure out, OK, if uh, the DB instance requires the security group, I have to create the security group beforehand. Uh, yeah, so that's basically it. Um, this can be uh, tested in different environments. So, for example, if you if you plan to add a new uh, database or add a cache to your infrastructure, you can roll this out into your staging environment uh, and then uh, run the same um, the same config uh, apply the same configuration into your production environment. Um, Terraform is basically two uh, commands. First step is uh, planning, and it will give you an output. Okay, this this has to be done, or I. I I plan to do this. Are you sure you want to do it? And then you apply, and uh, most of the times it works. Sometimes not. Uh, in the in the background, the state file will, gener will be generated, and you can can see the state file as an artifact of your entire infrastructure. So everything that is managed by Terraform, with all its dependencies, all its uh, resource addressing, is stored in the state file. This can be shared uh, between uh, the members of the team, between teams. So uh, if I'm running Terraform uh, now, uh, Bash can take uh, uh, make changes to, to the configuration and run it, uh, tomorrow based on the same um, uh, state. OK. And, uh, um, that's fine. So we now have uh, our infrastructure laid out. We have uh, reproducible builds, but they have to go somewhere, right? And Bash will tell you how this works. So, so if you, as you might have noticed uh, until this point, uh, no UI was harmed in the making of this artifact. So um, everything we, we described was described in a um, kind of JSON or HashiCorp syntax style. But it's all code. So until now, we haven't left the actual code bit. Um, and this might sound like some neckbeardy stuff, but I actually like code because it's like readable and, in most cases, self-documenting. Um, and we could have go on and just like ship our build container um, onto some platform as a service that's already there. Um, but this wasn't like our style. So we were lucky enough that uh, we got another tool to play with. And um, we're going to that in a minute. But until now, everything you saw were our ind independent Unix-style tools. So at any point, you could have just like gone with uh, AWS um, CloudFormation and just built your infrastructure with that. So there's, there's no direct dependency between those tools. You could have, at any point, just switched Packer for your own uh, custom-built uh, QEMO builder. So there's no direct connection. It's only just. Uh, metadata on the artifacts, and that is just, that's the thing that's uh, transferred between the environments. You could have built your own build pipeline, 
set up your own CI server with that um, if you want. But until now, it's all described in, in readable files. Um, so let's see how we could run and connect this. Just a spoiler, this isn't the tool we're talking about. Nomad is another tool in this toolbox, but it isn't the one tool our quiz was about. Um, Nomad is a distributed, highly available data center aware scheduler. That sounds like a lot, but actually there are some schedulers around, and you've seen already some in the previous talks. But Nomad was the, the best fit because it was integrated pretty well with the other tools. Um, so let's have a look at our million dollar app again. If you remember the Packer artifact from before, um, that's, the, that's the thing that's gone down here. So in this case, we have to have a demo with a, uh, with a Docker image we've built. Um, but it's a description that's larger than it. And as you can see, we do have a job. We do have regions and data centers. And this is the bit where the actual server and the actual infrastructure, or more speaking of like the actual image and the infrastructure, get connected. So until now, it's all independent tools, and we um, could have switched them out. And now we take one tool and combine it to describe the actual infrastructure around the software we want to run. And uh, it's more, it's a bit of pseudocode. We also removed some um, bits to make it more readable, but you get the idea. So we take uh, 2400 servers and run an image on it. And it's, it, gets it gets executed on it each system uh, Nomad will, uh, the Nomad agent will run on. Um, so think of, the, like, think of Nomad as like a schedule that transforms your artifact into actual running services. And in the same way um, the other tools do it, um, Nomad connects your infrastructure with your actual services. So have a look at our um, uh, display again. We now have dev production parity by using Vagrant or any other tool. Um, we have repeatable builds because they are all covered by Packer. We can track artifacts, be it in a registry we set up or um, be it in um, AWS AMIs. And we, we've gone to immutable infrastructure because and this, if you've gone this far, there's no point in logging into a server and changing something manually. There's, there's no point in um, checking something on the actual system. Um, and maybe you haven't noticed that until now, but there's uh, one thing still missing. We've described servers, we've described networks, um, we described um, databases. Um, there's service discovery. Um, and there are plenty of solutions out there. And this is, this is not about just like, uh, getting Conzo into this um, whole thing. You could also use uh, ETCD, or you could use uh, all the other registries out there. This is just something like we left as an exercise for the uh, reader. So going back to our quiz. Um, so in case anyone, no one has Googled it, uh, we were talking about SimKey. So does anyone remember SimKey? Yeah, well, as neither, so this was something I stumbled upon on the internet. Um, this was a, in a blog post from the O'Reilly Radar uh, in 2005. So just to get things into perspective. So this was something uh, you would read as a developer over 10 years ago. And it, I mean, it sounds really good, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. So um, just for you to get things into perspective. So we're still reading announcements like this every other week. There's literally the same words in a different order. Um, but all of those problems existed 10 years ago, uh, were claimed to be solved 10 years ago, and somehow I get the feeling that we've just like, approached them from another side. Um, so to summarize. Yeah. Um, as, we, as we said uh, before when talking about tools, you, you have to find the adequate tool for your problems, right? So uh, don't, don't be distracted by what the uh, others are doing. So look at what they're doing and maybe get inspired. But uh, uh, if, if it's not a right fit for you, don't, don't be afraid or ashamed uh, that, that you can't use those tools. If you have another, every problem is unique. So uh, at least we, we think that of uh, our problems uh, most of the time. Uh, you have just to, to look how it uh, works out for you. So this uh, doesn't mean. Um, you, you should not uh, build solid systems or uh, uh, good solutions that are well engineered, but uh, you don't have to jump on every new tool you, you get there. Uh, so that should be the main uh, point you take from our talk, if anything. 
Uh, open and pluggable solutions are favorable in our in our um, opinion because you're yeah you're flexible to interchange uh, parts of your tool chain uh, uh, for for things that are uh, better suited that that, uh, um, that came up so uh, yeah open so of course you you can interact with it so terraform and pucker for example especially terraform uh, is a, is a really active project, and yeah, with it being closed source, uh, I don't think I, I would use it or it would be usable at all, um, because yeah, so they're supporting a lot of stuff, and being this open really helps to understand what's happening underneath. Uh, yeah, uh, look look for those two uh, properties of of tools, uh, and you, you should appreciate the parts of your infrastructure that actually work. Uh, not always uh, trying to change everything just because it's uh, three years old. If it's running and don't make any uh, problems, uh, it's uh, eventually a very good uh, part of your architecture infrastructure. So it's uh, no need to just change it for the sake of changing it and uh, using the newest uh, technology. And um, yeah, to coming to an end, uh, to uh, help you with uh, uh, um, identifying those parts and uh, maybe give a sticker to them. We we have this saying. Uh, Good as butter, <laughs> or in um, German, good, uh, good wie Butter. So, uh, if you want, you can. We, we got some stickers, and you can put it on your infrastructure, organigrams, uh, whatever, wherever you spot a point uh, where you got uh, good running uh, stuff. Yeah, and that's it from us. Thanks. Have you looked into the tool Otto? Yeah. And any, any more uh, follow-up questions? <laughs> now what do you think? Um, do you use it uh, actively or do you just play with it? Uh, yeah, uh, right now we just played with it. Uh, but uh, uh, the thing about Otto is also from HashiCorp, it integrates all the other tools. So uh, it uses Wacom to run locally, you, it uses Pucker to create uh, the servers to deploy, it uses Terraform to uh, set up the infrastructure and move those builds by Pucker onto it. and. Uh, uh, it's a little bit confusing, so if you want to look at it, uh, it has some weird magic to detect what kind of application it is, but uh, in our view, that's not about what, what Otto is about. Uh, you can just uh, switch out all this generated stuff to your own, uh, uh, to your own Pucker and Terraform uh, modules, uh, if, if you like. But it's a, it's a promising tool, and uh, yeah, maybe uh, uh, yeah, in, in, in this year we, we happen to uses in, in a production environment, but it's still very early on and uh, yeah. Any other questions? Everyone is hungry <laughs> and tired. Then, yeah. Thanks. Okay, and thanks again. Uh, get a sticker if you want. <laughs>